Welcome to the Tailored Life Podcast, the one and only fitness and nutrition podcast that goes way beyond just training and nutrition. I am your host, Cody McBroom, and with me is my co-host, Travis McQueen. Today we got a Q&A. Yeah, rapid fire. Rapid fire. Yeah, right. We, they've all heard it before. Dude, I actually did pretty fucking good last on, on the last one, yeah. It was not bad. Um, I mean, it Fun. wasn't like underrated, overrated, where it's like over, under, yeah. you know what I mean? But we got to do that wasn't again, even, too. Yeah, it wasn't even like that, though. Not at all. Yeah, that one wasn't either, but it took us an hour for 10 overrated, underrated. All right. Um, let's get right into the questions. First one we have is from Nat.Nutritional. It says, how often do you feel... People are underappreciated of the information that you share. I honestly rarely ever feel that way. To be actually, the only thing that even resembles a close feeling to that is when I create something or or we create something that's like really really good, and I don't feel like it gets a lot of engagement, and I don't feel like it's being underappreciated. I think it's not being seen because mm. the way social media works that if you don't have like like the perfect hook to yep. get somebody watching or listening or seeing and you don't post at a certain time or whatever it may be, if your first line of a caption just doesn't hit so right that they get to read the rest of it, um, sometimes I feel like it's underseen. Uh, because there's a lot of times too where like I'll just post a picture and I'll have like a, a, a caption that I feel is really, really, really powerful and educational and impactful but the the post just doesn't get much engagement at all. And the reason is because it's a picture that somebody's just not interested in. Totally. And obviously my caption isn't grabbing them right away quick enough. Um, whereas we've seen this too, where like something very simple can actually be really, really like get a lot of Powerful. engagement. Yeah. Um, so, you know, which as you get better at content creation, you can learn more of that, I think. And so you can kind of bait and switch, right? Use the tactics that get people's attention really well and then give them valuable content you want to to really deliver <clears throat> that might not get as much attention on the front end if you just went in with that. Um, but I never feel like people are underappreciating it, especially because I get a, I actually get a lot of cool people that reach out and tell me. Positive feedback. Yeah, like people will like send like actual like handwritten mail to the where to our headquarters, you know, and like literally say how much the content has helped them. They're not yeah. even a client. So like stuff like that shows like if, if, cause I know for me, if, if I wrote a handwritten letter to somebody who I just followed on Instagram or listened to their podcast, like they would really have to influence me. Totally. Like that's pretty fucking cool. So I don't ever feel that way. Yeah. So, so none. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's well appreciative. I'm actually really, really grateful for how much appreciation I get for it. Um, especially because I consider it, it's like, it, it's just part of who I am and what I do. It's part of my job. Like my role is to do this. Yep. So I don't need appreciation. I have to do this. It's like my, to me, it's an obligation. Like I have no, I heard somebody talking about that with uh, even like success, like working hard and, and becoming successful. It's, it, it, it's not even a choice. It's an obligation. Mm. Like, like I, ha- I have to do this. I have to be a hard worker. I have to be disciplined. I have to do these things because the people in my life and the things I want to give them or create for them, I'm the only person that's going to do this and, and be able to do that for them. And it was cool how we said it, but it's the same thing for me with content. That's a piece of it for me. So totally. like, I have to do it, you know, so. Love it. But. All right, so uh, question two says, can extreme GI issues inhibit you from making progress? I would say yes. I think that, I mean, there's, there's, three scenarios here really there's one scenario where um your severe gut issues are a part of a much bigger problem so you actually have an autoimmune related issue that is directly or indirectly causing gut issues and therefore your autoimmune issue is the thing that is causing you to not make gains in the gym or not see results aesthetically and part of the symptoms or the biofeedback you're getting that shows you you do have this issue is, is the digestive issue. Mm. There's another side of it where you have uh, like malabsorption. So you have such severe gut issues that your body's actually not absorbing nutrients properly or at all and uh, or to a very lesser degree. And if you're doing that, you got to think about it. If you're eating a 2,000 calorie diet, and you have a lot of malabsorption, you're not getting 
the macronutrients out of those calories that are going to actually fuel your body to change. And you're probably not getting the micronutrients out of those 2000 calories that are helping your body stay healthy and adapt and change like the vitamins and the minerals, the carbs, the proteins, amino acids, all those things that are in the food you're taking in. If you have malabsorption, you're not absorbing it. So, um, and that's a huge digestive issue. Excuse me. So that's, that's one area. And then the other one is like, if you have digestive stress, um, that can be related to mental stress as well. Cause you know, the gut and the brain, there is a connection there. So if you're stressed the fuck out, you, you're not going to get results because cortisol is high. You're not going to get results because you're unmotivated. Um, then you're bloated all the time. So you feel like garbage. You're not going to want to hit the gym because you don't like the way you look. Your body feels off and you don't, you're like lethargic. You don't have good energy. So it's again, it's like the gut issue is just one of many things that's causing you to have issues. Um, but that's also to say, like, if you do have some gut issues or digestive stress, it doesn't mean you can't get results because we have plenty of clients who are getting great results and they do have some digestive issues that we're trying to work on. You know, they're not nearly as severe as an autoimmune issue or, or severe malabsorption, but they do have constant bloat, gas, digestive issues, uh, intolerances, things like that, that we need to repair and fix. They're still going to get results, but we just got to fix this digestive issue along the way. Totally. So it kind of depends. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, next question is from Jay Mills. Oh, I didn't even say the last one, but this one's from Jay Mills, uh, space NJ. Did I waste... Who's the last one from? Jesse Woodley 3. So we can give her a shout out. Yeah. Jay Mills. You know who that is? Not this one, but a different one. <laughs> the artist? Yeah, from Young Money. Yeah. I saw Jay Mills. Wow, that's so cool, dude. <laughs> I thought it was tight. I mean... <laughs> I was, with, I was with Thomas <laughs> yeah. in uh, Palm Springs. Oh, We were at that wow. one, re- have you been to that restaurant out there that like all the actors and shit go to? The one he takes us to? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I was, I was 15. So oh, him we, and my, or we, we went 14. We went young. the night before you came to Palm Springs. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I went there with Mike and, and everybody. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but there was like pictures like, uh, I almost said Rocky, but Sylvester Stallone and shit like that all over yeah. the walls. Yeah. Um, and Jay Mills was with a group of people. He wasn't with Lil Wayne, but- mm. I remember me and Thomas just being like, yo, J. that's Mills. J. Mills. He had a chain on and everything. It was like, <laughs> damn. <laughs> that was wild. It was like an eighth grader. That was like the coolest thing ever. Yeah. All right. Uh, it comes from J. Mills and J. It says, did I waste newbie gains if I failed at body recomp as be- as a bag during my first cut? As a bag? B-E-G. Beginner. Oh, I'm going to yeah. assume. Yeah. Did I waste newbie gains if I failed at body recomp as a beginner during my first cut? Um, no, I mean, here's the thing is like, you can't waste newbie gains. I actually, I have a theory that you literally can never waste newbie gains because here's the thing. Um, if you train for two years straight, so a lot of people say after your first year or two, newbie gains are done. But if you train two years straight, like shit, you, you're, you're still a newbie after two years. Because you didn't train properly, you didn't progressively overload, you didn't get results, so you didn't get big, you didn't get strong, you were doing the wrong things in the gym, you didn't do your diet well, like you didn't experience newbie gains, so you're still a newbie, yeah. right? Until you give your body the first dose of, of a true, hard, and stressful stimulus in the gym, you are a newbie. So if it takes you four years before you figure shit out right, you'll start experiencing newbie gains Four years in, because we've had clients plenty of times come to us that have been at it for three or four years doing the wrong shit. And it's nothing against them. They don't do this for a living. So they didn't know better. They did classes. They tried different fad diets. They just did the wrong things. Or they were like tip, dipping their toes in, right? So they started training and then they stopped for six months and they got back into it for a few months and they stopped for another few months. And they never gave their body a chance to go through that whole process. And then they come on board with us and we train them the right way for a consistent six to 12 months. And they experience newbie gains after trying for four years. Why? It's because they finally did the right thing consistently enough for the first time. Yeah. So you can be a newbie, newbie, like being a newbie or a beginner and, ex, uh, intermediate and advanced lifter is less about how long have you been lifting and more about how well do you understand lifting? How well are you lifting? Because I'm an advanced lifter, not because I've been lifting for 11 years now, but because I've been lifting correctly for eight years. Yeah. Cause the first couple of years I didn't do it right. Right. So like for eight or nine years now, I've been doing it really well, really hard, really consistently. So I'm, I'm definitely an advanced lifter, but 
I was at a point where I remember when I first got into the gym that I was interning at Vigor, it was like, I've been doing this for two years, but I was doing all the wrong shit, not all the wrong stuff, but I was doing quite a bit that suboptimally. Then I got with the right people and started doing the right stuff. And I gained like 20 pounds of muscle. Like it was pure muscle because I didn't get fat in the process. I didn't get leaner, but I just got bigger. And it was like, whoa, I thought my newbie gains were done. It's like, no, you're still a newbie because you haven't been doing it right. But after that 20 pounds, I mean, I went from 155 to 175 pounds. I, I rarely get past, you know, I'm 172 right now, 171. So unless I want to bulk and put on fat, I don't go past that. You know what I mean? So like that was my like sprint to getting as big as I could. And now I've just gained a little bit of weight over the years and I'm leaner than I was then. But um, yeah, I don't think you wasted it, man. Like I think, you know, you, you, usually people shouldn't even go into an aggressive cut when they're newbies, unless they have a lot of weight to lose. Like if you're just an average dude that like you want to like, recomp yeah i would stay at maintenance because you're going to experience new begins if you do things right eat enough protein eat at maintenance do some conditioning but just lift the right way and try to build muscle you will recomp for totally. sure so no you didn't waste a minute not at all nice all right so uh next one is from 1000 year young oh did you go through any business coaching programs developing your business 1000 years young yeah Articulate that for me. I don't get it. It feels young all the time. Huh? I just a thousand don't. years young. I wonder what the significance of a thousand is. You know, like is people say, a, like, like uh, Andreas' birthday is today. Mm. Um, I think he's 40. Is it Wednesday today? Yeah. Yeah. 41, I think he said, or 43. I don't know. It said on his post. I can't remember. I know he's early 40s. Yeah, he talked about it. But people would say, oh, I'm 43 years young today. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's a common thing. A thousand. A thousand years young. Don't think about it too hard. I know. I mean, I am. I'm going to be thinking about it all day. <laughs> <laughs> Go message him. <laughs> She's like, I put my shit in a name generator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was random. You know, that's how Childish Gambino got his rap name? Yeah. A Wu-Tang name generator. Dude, we should get Wu-Tang names. Mm. Write that down. That'd be sick. There's a name generator for Wu-Tang names. Gotcha. Method Man, Ghostface Killa, Childish Gambino, Red Man. Wow. Old Dirty Bastard. There's a lot of people in Wu-Tang. Wow. It's a big group. It's like 28 members. What? Oh, yeah, dude. Wu-Tang is huge. I and, like, just random people pop into songs. I have no idea. It's really sick. Dude. It's yeah. like it's just like a huge gang. I like, don't know anything about them. Yeah, they're dope. They're, it's a cl- they're in... Uh, Did you say it's a clan? No, it's, oh. a, uh, it's they're a gang. Oh. <laughs> it's basically like a huge I thought gang. you said, yeah, it's a clan. Like, um, it's called Wu-Tay Clan, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, no, they were on Hip Hop Evolution. That, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, okay, so did I have any business coaching development, right? Did you go through any business uh, development courses or... I don't think it was coaching. thousand years young. Did you go through any business coaching programs developing your business? Um, yes. More, le- more mentorships than anything versus courses or programs. Um, it's hard to say, though, because it's like, you know, I, I learned so much uh, working for somebody who was really, really into business stuff. And he ran an in-person business, mm-hmm. you know, and he knew I wanted to run an online business. So I just watched and asked questions, you know. Uh, some of it applied to what I would do later. Some of it didn't. Then I got mentors, um who I could just learn from, ask questions, get on calls with, set goals with, be held accountable by. I still do to this day. Um, that's always been my main source is just having a coach that works with me on personal development as a whole. I think that's the thing most people miss the ball on, right? Like I've done seminars and I've read books and I've done like online workshops where I wasn't necessarily worried about like being certified in this thing or anything like that. But it's just like a workshop just so I can get the content from it and do it on my own pace. Um, Re, uh, I've just read so many fucking books more than that. Cause I, I think the even, answer here is more mentors. Yeah. Like to help develop when, your business. Yeah. Cause the rest is just a lot of books, yeah. a lot of books. And then watching, watching people, what people do is like huge. I mean, observing, you know, I told Mike Matthews that last time we were on the podcast with him, I think it was last time, or maybe it was when he interviewed me for his, whenever that airs. But I've, I said, I was like, man, I honestly, I watch your shit from afar, you know, and I see what you guys put out and I'm trying to see how, and that's the supplement industry. But like, 
how is that going to work for them? How would that work for me? You know, I would look at other people in my industry. How's that working for them? How's that going to work for me? Um, I even look at a lot of, uh, like clothing brands, clothing brands do stuff really well with, uh, like abandoned cart, right? Like I, this brand right here, like I love this brand. I'll get a text. Hey, you were looking at something. Do you still want to check it out? And it's like a link and it goes right to what I was looking at. So these motherfuckers are smart. Yeah. Cause I didn't even put it in my cart yet. Yeah. But I was logged in. Yeah. Because if I made an account, they would give me 10% off. And then it's like, okay, well, how do these things work? You know, some of that stuff doesn't apply to me, but I, I, and this is where I think my brain works a little differently. I'm never going to be able to use an abandoned cart like that because nobody, I'm not going to be like, Hey, you almost applied for coaching and we're going to like, and it texts them automatically. Do you want to consider that again? Because if you go to my website and look at it, I don't have anything on you. You know what yeah. I mean? I can't repurpose you and we don't run ads. So I'm not going to retarget you that way through spiders and shit, which a lot of companies do. That's why you see ads for stuff that you look at. Um, but I go, okay, does this annoy me or does it intrigue me? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, how was this experience? How long did it take for them to send me that text? Because I know this multi-million dollar company does research on how long to follow up. You know, I looked at that 24 hours ago, right? Or is, was it just a few hours ago, you know, or is it days ago? Like, do they send a second follow up? So I look at those things and I try to pinpoint like, okay, I can apply follow up. I can apply things that intrigue the audience, not annoy them yeah. and, and little things like that. And, um, aesthetically pleasing things on a website and how things flow. So I'm constantly observing things. And then I usually have somebody in my corner that I can just bounce ideas off of and ask questions. You know, once upon a time before I knew how to do anything online, before I jumped into online coaching, I did hire somebody where I was like, dude, I need to figure shit out. And they definitely helped me with some business stuff. But more than anything, um, and this is a common thing with most of my mentors that I've ever had, it's more personal development. Who are you as a person? Who are you as a leader? Who are you as a coach? How are you showing up? How clear are you on who you want to become, where you want to take the company, what you want to put out for people, how you want to show value? Because those things are what's going to generate leads. That's what's going to get people bought into your company, so on and so forth. And, um, that's my main thing. So like, you know, Andreas, I would consider him assumed to be an advisor for the whole team, obviously, but it's much more personal development, but I definitely ask him business questions because yeah. he's been around the block with that too, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of people get so sucked into business development strategies with funnels and marketing and campaigns that they forget to be a good leader and a good person and how you show up day to day in front of people who could be potential customers. That's how the fuck you, you influence people and you like you create something that grows, you know, and how I show up for my team influences how they show up and how they show up influences their clients and how their clients feel influences what they tell people about. And now it's this web and it's a huge, it's just a trickle reflection on you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and you have to be that person. So I think more than anything, people need to focus on that, you know, and there's good, I mean, there's a lot of great books, E-Myth, creating a story brand, start with why the infinite game, um, rocket fuel. I mean, there's so many good business books I've read that have given me really like aha moments. Usually I read a whole book and I have like one takeaway that was on one page. (laughs) So like I'll read and read and read and it's like, bingo, that's the thing. But um, if you look at every big business, it, it starts the way I look at it at least is, is it always comes down to there's like, there's a very influential leader at the top and they're very, very, uh, integrated and well connected with the people on their team. And that's what I think makes companies grow. And if you're a solo coach right now, you got to become that person right now because your team quote unquote is your client base and yep. your followers and your podcast listeners. And that's how things grow. Totally. I mean, we're. Uh, wouldn't call us a word of mouth company, but I mean, we don't run ads. So it's like, it's, it's tr- truly just people sharing our stuff and talking about our stuff, which means you have to provide value to do that. No coach or business coach is going to tell me how to do that. Cause I can't monitor. Like they, they might tell you to do it. Yeah. The best, I think the best business uh, strategies or advice I've ever gotten from a business coach is do more of you. Mm. You know what I mean? Less of don't like overcomplicate shit. I've actually had had times where you start getting carried away and you're like, see things, you're like, oh, we could do this, we could try this, or maybe we should do this. And I've had people tell me like, dude, slow down. Like, how did you get here? Well, doing this, this, and this. Okay, just keep doing that. You have more eyes on it now. 
that shit worked and it will still work. Totally. You know, it works on a different scale now. Yep. Bigger scale. Yeah. But I mean, being true to who you are is so powerful, especially in this industry. You know, I think there's different industries where it matters differently. Um, like a, a product, like this road, uh, what is this thing called again? Roadcaster? Roadcaster. I don't see the caster on it. Mm. Um, so there's Roadcaster that's recording our podcast. Do you know who John Road is? No. I don't even know if it is John Road. Yeah. Exactly. It doesn't matter. Yeah. How they're going to grow is not the same how we're going to grow. So yeah. I think it's, it, it truly depends on that. So Great um, analogy. Yeah. But I, uh, I have had business coaches, um, more like personal development mentors if I look at who's been the most influential and the rest has just been books. Yeah. Have you ever tried to find the lab results or the qualifications behind the supplements you're taking? Probably not. In fact, it's pretty hard to find because the supplement industry can be a shady place and it's really hard to do background checks to find out where the, the, the products and the ingredients are sourced and see if there's any lab tests publicly available online. But the cool thing about Legion is they give you all the information you can possibly need and provide you with content around education for training and nutrition outside of the supplement industry. So they'll teach you how to improve your body without their product, but they'll give you a product that supplements that to help benefit you and get better results along the way. Not to mention they're on Labdoor, so you can see their rankings as one of the top supplement companies for purity and quality that is on the market. I cannot recommend them enough, and I've been recommending them to clients, members, uh, my friends, my family, everybody for years. I've been using them for years, and now to have them as a podcast sponsor is pretty damn cool. So if you enter your promo code BOOM BOOM, you'll save 20% on your first order and start collecting points. You can also head over to buylegion.com slash BOOM BOOM. Now, without any further ado, let's get back to the podcast. Nice. All right. So next one comes from Sydney Hahn. It says, what is your take on quote unquote metabolic flexibility and fat burning versus sugar burning? Um, what you eat is what you burn, plain and simple. So I think that metabolic flexibility is a thing. Um, and metabolic flexibility basically means that your body has the ability to, to vary the energy sources it uses for daily activities or training or anything. So um, if I'm metabolically flexible, my body will more easily use carbs or fat for fuel versus if I'm on a keto diet, I am going to basically primarily use fat for fuel. Like that's my primary fuel source. I'm not going to be good at burning carbs. If I'm on a high carb diet and I barely eat any fats, I'm not going to be as good at burning fat. Um, being metabolic, metabolically flexible allows me to do both. Now, there's value in that from a health perspective um, and maybe from an energy systems perspective. I think it gets over, uh, overly hyped, I guess. It, it, when it, in regards to fat loss, because at the end of the day, neither one is like if you burn calories off of your like you're gonna lose weight. You know what I mean? So examples like people dive into a high fat diet, like a keto diet, because you burn more fat when you're on a keto diet, which is very true. But if I tell you, hey, you'll burn more fat doing a keto diet, any person who doesn't know the deep science is like, okay, fuck yeah, let's do a keto diet then, yeah. because I want to burn fat, but. If I said, hey, you'll burn more carbs if you do a high-carb diet, you're going to be like, okay, I want to burn fat, right? Because fat is what's stored on me that I don't like. Yeah. But the reason studies can prove that you burn more fat with a keto diet is because they literally will, will actually be – I mean, I don't know how they're – whether it's blood work or they have like monitors, they're testing you, they're measuring things. They see more fat burned – but not more fat lost yeah. off of your body. Because if I take in 100 grams of fat on one diet and 50 grams of fat on another diet, this 100 gram fat diet is going to be burning more fat. It'll show more fat is being burned. But if I'm in a huge surplus in that group because there's more fat, which is also more calories, I'm also going to gain a bunch of fat. I'm simply burning more fat as fuel because I have more fat coming in, especially if we drop carbs, because if we drop carbs really low, there's no other fuel source to burn. If we're on a high carb diet, and uh, this is like the sugar burning thing, because technically sugar or carbohydrates are glucose and glucose can be broken down to sugar. I mean, it is a type of sugar. So if we have low fat and high carb, then 
we're going to show we're burning a lot of carbs. We're burning a lot of sugar, right? It's it, because we have more carbs present. But at the end of the day, if we put both of those scenarios in a controlled caloric and protein setting, neither one is necessarily going to be superior for total fat loss. Now, if you're strength training, there is some research that would actually favor the low fat diet because carbs are going to be preferentially burned more for strength training and high performance, and you have less fat that could potentially be stored on your body because it's harder to store carbs as fat. So if anything, the high carb, low fat would actually be even superior for fat loss. But let's not get into the weeds and let's just say all, all things equal. You're not actually burning more fat off of your body. You're simply burning more fat that you're taking in through the diet, yep. plain and simple, which is an unsufficient, it's a, it's a less sufficient fuel source if you're doing things at high intensities. If you don't strength train at all, um, if, you, if you don't train at all and all, like the only activity you do is uh, walking or maybe go on some hikes or whatever, just like really low, you're not training, period. And you're doing the shit we do all day. We're sitting in the office recording, doing this shit. That would be fine because I don't need a ton of carbs to do this. I mean, carbs are a good fuel source for your brain, but you don't need that many carbs because you're not going to burn unless you're playing a chess tournament, which we've talked about. <laughs> Opposed to doing like a man- manual labor. Exactly. Yeah. If you're doing manual labor, you need way more carbs. Yeah. Now, if I'm doing this, I will use carbs for fuel because it does help my brain. But when I strength train, that's when I'm burning a lot of carbs. And the more muscle I build, the more carbs I'm going to be able to handle because my muscles require carbs to be stored as glycogen. Um, So I think metabolic flexibility is like a cool strategy. And I think in theory, it could be like a really cool thing because people go, well, if I have low carb, high fat days, I can train my body to burn more fat. And then when I have my high carb days, I'm going to be burning fat too. And it's just not the case. Whatever... Uh, it happens on such a small degree that it's not going to make a big difference. Like at the end of the day, whatever you're taking more in that day, if you're metabolically flexible, you're going to burn more of. Um, and if you're not metabolically flexible, it's whatever you stick to, high carb, high, low carb, you're going to burn more of, right? More fat or more carb. Um, and the calorie deficit is what's ultimately going to lead to more weight loss. Totally. So um, long-winded answer, but I think it's just, or I think it's not as crazy or big of a deal as a lot of people make it seem to be. Um, Cause it, it's just another one of those things where it still just boils down to calories in versus calories out. Um, and I'm a much bigger fan of giving people more carbs to fuel training. Cause most people we work with, they train. Now we do have clients that have autoimmune issues that we can't give them a lot of carbs, or we have people who they just don't strength train that much. So we don't give them carbs or they're in a cut and their carbs are low right now because their whole calorie base is low. Um, So there's times for it, but um, I don't think it's as valuable as people assume it to be. Totally. Stick with one. Cool. All right. Um, Next one will come from somebody. I lost it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay. So the next one will come from Mad Haven. I've been waiting to use that button. Band around knees for hip thrusts, question mark. Yeah, it's great. I think uh, I don't think you need it. Um, I like using that if somebody like, really struggles to get their glutes burning um, and, and activated during a hip thrust. But we can also, also remember, too, your glutes are going to be in charge of hip extension and hip abduction. And there's not research to prove this, so it's very hard. Um, and I'm not, like, the biomechanics expert. But my thing is this, like, I think it's a band aid. So if you're if you're doing hip thrust and you're like, I don't feel it in my glutes, and I throw a band around your knee, now you're having to force your knees outward, which is creating hip abduction and hip external rotation. That's going to fire your glutes mm-hmm. because your glutes also control external rotation and hip abduction. But now your glutes are activated through external rotation, and hip abduction, not through extension. So if I remove that band next time. Your glutes still aren't going to fire through hip extension. I need them to fire through hip extension as well. So this is an easy tool to use if somebody's glutes aren't firing. Um, However, it doesn't really fix the issue. So I've used it for variations, and I think that's powerful. Like I'll have people do hip thrust, then I'll have people do a deficit hip thrust, then I'll have people do a hip thrust with band abduction. It's just another cool variation because if I can add – and I do think that hip abduction is missing. There's a lot of people who do so many like women who want to build their butts and their, and their glutes and their hamstrings and their whole lower body. And they do hip thrusts and RDLs and squats. And they rarely do hip abductions because it's kind of like, I don't want to sit there and just, you know, move my legs. Yeah. It's just, it's not a tiring exercise. However, it's a missing piece in, in any physique 
or a bikini athlete, they do a ton of those because it's going to build the outer part of your glute. It's going to build a different part of your glute that is actually going to make your glute sit higher. Like if you want like a perky butt, for lack of better terms, you need hip abduction. Mm. Um, so I put them in all the time. Like if I have a girl who has physique aspirations, we'll do hip abduction three times a week. And I'm just like, fuck it. We'll just throw them at the end or at the beginning. It doesn't need to be this cool exercise. But we got to do it because it's a function of the hips and it's a part of the glute that doesn't get enough attention. Yeah. Especially if you do have poor hip extension or a hip external rotation, when you're going into a squat or you're doing a deadlift or a hip thrust and you're not doing any of that, now it's not getting any attention. But the point is, is I think it's a great exercise as an added variation, but it's not going to fix your inability to fire your glutes during a hip thrust. So if you can't feel your glutes in an RDL or in a hip thrust, we need to fix your hip hinge and hip extension. I want your glutes working at the peak of the hip thrust when you're squeezing your butt and you're going through hip extension, which if it's not, you're probably in, uh, probably in lumbar extension. So you probably need to pull your rib cage down and get your core tight because if you're in lumbar extension, you're just not going to go into full hip extension, get your glutes to do the job. You're relying a lot on your low back. Like let's compress your rib cage. And if you still don't feel it, you're probably feeling it in your hamstrings, which I see a lot, which probably means that your, your feet are too far out. Um, or you're dragging your heels in. So a lot of times when people do hip thrust, they'll kind of drag their heels into the floor and their heels aren't close enough back. So they're basically doing kind of like an isometric leg curl, firing their, their hamstrings. Because if I drive my heels towards my butt, like a uh, knee flexion, yeah. my hamstrings fire. Yeah. So rather make sure your, your, your tibia, your shin is completely perpendicular. It's vertical. It's not slanted at all. It's perfectly vertical at the top and bottom of that hip thrust. Drive your heels into the floor, but don't drag them back. Um, and one of the cues I always use with people too is, is push your hips to the ceiling. A lot of people think, back so when I drive back onto my shoulders onto the bench now I am going into extension my rib cage flares and I push my heels away from me um, which doesn't always help get the glutes fired but if I drive my hips to the ceiling now I'm looking up I'm not leaning back I'm driving my hips f literally straight up above me towards the ceiling same thing with a single leg hip thrust bend your knee and drive your knee towards the ceiling not back towards your face if you do that most of the time it it, it changes the angle of how you're pushing yourself into hip extension it helps fire the glutes quite a bit um but yeah long story short if you need the band in order to feel your your glutes during hip thrust try all those things i just said um and if it still doesn't work then you probably got to figure out something else but yeah. um i usually one of those things fixes it totally all right uh next one will come from hannah unscripted thoughts on creatine i fucking love creatine <laughs> I've been taking creatine for years every single day. Um, it's one of the most studied supplements you can possibly get. It's going to help strength. It's going to help recovery. It's going to help build muscle. It's going to help muscle endurance. It's going to help hydrate the muscle for better recovery. Um, it's going to, um, it actually improves some brain function. There's actually some some research that leads to, to thinking it might help with neurodegenerative diseases. So like if you have Alzheimer's or anything like that in your family, or you just want to avoid your brain getting old, take some fucking creatine. But um, there's literally nothing bad that has ever come out of creatine. It helps, uh, injury prevention. Um, I can't remember the mechanism behind it, but I think it's just like you, there's a benefit of tissue with your ligaments, your joints, and you're less likely to get injured. Um, there was one thing that was a plausible myth and I believe they just did a study. I don't know if it's out yet. Um, I'm going to ask Eric Trexler cause I think he's part of it. Uh, the research, but like that it causes hair loss. Um, but I'm pretty sure they debunked that too. And I've been, I mean, I've been taking creatine a long time and I'm not yeah. balding. So <laughs> knock on wood, <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, creatine's great. I don't, there's not anybody I think shouldn't take it. I got my dad taking it. He doesn't even work out. Yeah. Actually he does now. He's been lifting, not lifting, but he's got like, I got him just like band set up. Yeah. Sick for golf. Dope. Yeah. But, um, but he's taking creatine. Yeah. Cool. All right, next one comes from Ashlyn Christine. Says, favorite exercises for rear delts? Uh, dumbbell chest supported rear delt swings. Um, I think we just recorded a YouTube video on it, but it's not on YouTube yet. Um, I know what we did, but we just haven't uploaded yet because I think we recorded that one just a couple weeks ago. We just haven't had a chance to upload it yet. So, um, in fact, that's a shameless plug. The Taylor Trainer. Go to YouTube. Dude, have you? Do, I last time I searched the Taylor Trainer, I didn't see it again. You seen that? I see it all the time. 
Okay, good. Because like it's restart, not popping up on my. Have you restart your computer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's the issue. I need to clear my catch or my cookies or whatever. Um, cash. Do you know? Oh my god! Isn't it catch? No. <laughs> Cash, cash. Oh. Um, we'll link it in the show notes so okay. you guys can click it. But it's literally just a huge exercise library. I mean, we got quite a bit of exercise on there. We still got to upload probably like twenty plus more. But every week we're uploading at least ten, if not twenty, because we just crank out a bunch of videos in the gym every Thursday and we upload them all. Um, it's partially for my app, but it's also because we just wanted you guys to be able to have a place where you can go and see new exercises or learn how to do exercises right. Use it for your programming for your clients or whatever you need them for. Um, so go over there, subscribe. You can check it out because there's a ton of great exercises on there. And I, and we will have a, a rear delt swings one on there soon. But rear delt swings just light up my rear delts. And rear delts are hard to hit because a lot of times people feel it in their traps. But the trick is, is if I'm doing a chest supported like rear, like reverse fly, essentially, I can keep my palms pronated and <clears throat> keep my upper back fired elbows bent a little bit. And I'm shrugging a little bit. And I'm trying to hit my traps. But all I need to do is at the bottom of it, when I'm leaning on the, the chest supported, so I'm going to try to do my best via audio with this, but when you're leaning on the chest supported bench, let your shoulders roll forward into protraction, rotate your hands so that when you do the fly, your pinkies are pointing backwards, and now I'm doing swings. And so when I do that, my, my, when my shoulders are actually protracted forward, kind of hunching over the bench, I'm going to avoid firing my traps. When my palms are facing down and my pinkies are facing back, I'm hammering those rear delts and I usually go with light dumbbells and I go 20 to 30 reps, like way up there. And they're called swings because you get to a point where you literally can't do a full range of motion rep and you have to swing. So you're just doing these partials, just trying to swing them up there. Um, and this is where it's like, eh, how much science is about this? I don't know, but it's just kind of like something that's been in the strength world is we, a lot of people believe that the rear delts and traps do really well with growth when you put them under uh, long durations of tension. So instead of me doing super heavy swings, I'm going to go lightweight and it goes as long as I can, right? That's why you're, I'm doing them for 30 seconds straight, trying to get 30 reps, you know, just swinging them back um, and burning them up. But chest supported rear delt swings with dumbbells, by far my favorite. Yeah. So, all right. Um, next one comes from Ash Kelsey Sazer. Uh, what do you look for when bringing on new interns or coaches? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> experience? Experience is there. I think first one is personality um, and diversity. Like, I mean, I, I everybody on my team is just like unique in their own way. You know what I mean? I think that's, to me, that's important. Um, I don't want, I shouldn't say I don't want, I want, I want great coaches, you know, but like, I think it's really important to have like different flavors. Like when you look at our team, they're all different in their own ways. They're from different places. They have different backgrounds. They have different goals. They're in different stuff. Yeah. They're just unique in their own way. And it's cool because we all get along really well and we're all like a tight family, but everybody's pretty fucking different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that's super valuable because we have so many people coming in that are from all walks of life. So it's like we have somebody that's going to relate to every person that comes on board no matter what. Um, so one thing I'm looking for is is a combination of being unique in your own way, like be you, and then your personality. Like literally if I can't see us kicking it with you, it's not going to happen. It, not because there's anything wrong with you, but – you got a vibe yeah. with us. You know, that's, that's really important. That comes before education or anything to me. Or environment. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm not even going to get on the phone with you unless I think like this is a cool ass person that we will all love to hang out with. <laughs> I'm like, let's, let's kick it. After that is, it is experience. It's a combination of education and experience. So both your, your experience with education prior to us talking, and then also your experience with, with clients. Like, have you worked with people? Um, we don't bring on any intern that hasn't already been coaching for a good amount of time. Um, at this point, we're, we're not here to take somebody who has never done it and build them into a coach. Nothing against that. That's great. Um, and I wish I had more time to help people like that. Cause I think that's a good thing to do, you know, but you know, with who we are and the people we're working with and, and the quality of coaching and information we provide our clients with, I mean, we we're tailored coaching methods. So it's tailored to you, which means it's very individual. It's very in depth. So that's a high standard, but I also hold us to like a luxury style um, coaching, not from necessarily from like a dollar standpoint, but more from like 
this is the highest quality coaching that you're going to find in the yeah. industry. And for that, you, you can't bring somebody on that's never done it. So even when somebody comes on as an intern, they're already in a position where I'm like, I already trust you to coach people yeah. for me. Like I already know you will do well. However, you're still going to go through a three month internship because it's kind of like, you know, prove, prove yourself, like prove to us that you want this, you know, and you're willing to do the work. Um, and it gives us time to show you our systems and how yeah. we do things. Um, so it's, it's definitely like uniqueness and personality and then it's experience and education. Um, yeah. And that's, and that's it. It's a huge one. Yeah. I think personality trumps everything else. I think too I love many, that in your process. Of too, too many people hire off of a resume that, because of what like certs they see, Yeah, you know, or qualifications, right? Or like, where did you work first or anything like that? And I'm, I look at your Instagram. Yeah. That's the first thing I do before I look at your resume and I'm just like, what? What is this person like? You know, are they vulnerable? Are they transparent? Um, do they have their own swag, their own style to things? Like, are they unique in their own way? And then talking to you, I, I'm going to get that vibe too. Yeah. You know, like, do we get along? Are you easy to talk to? Are you personable? Um, you know, and then like, because there's, you know, usually a process of like, okay, you talk to me now, talk to this person on the team. Yep. She's like the head coach that helps me run the internship. But I want to hear what they think, you know, do I get along really well with this person and vibe with this person, but this person doesn't, well, that's a problem, yep. you know, in this industry, you got to be a chameleon, like anybody walks through that door, or anybody walks through your application, you better be able to adapt and relate and talk and communicate and, and connect and let them feel open and, and trusting uh, enough to like tell you things and open up to you. And if you can't do that, like you're going to have a problem. Yeah. So that, that's huge. Agreed. All right, man. Um, we got a couple more here. Uh, next one, dude, <laughs> I have to say this because look at this text I just got new hats just dropped. Yeah. From this company. Yeah. So I was like, that's what we were saying. <laughs> I was get, looking I, at hats like weeks ago. Yeah, I get <laughs> that funny. a lot. It's a good bu business tactic. Yeah, it is. All right. Next one comes from Rachel Wheeler it says how many days a week of strike training slash cardio is really needed to get lean? Um, I mean, technically, cardio isn't even needed because if you, it, you the diet should create the the fat loss for you. However, at some times, like it's important. So, like right now, I do two days of cardio. It's usually a forty minute walk um, outside because it's nice out and I want to be outside. Um, and lately, work's just been so crazy that like if I can take two days a week to to just go home and do my cardio later at night, like mm -hmm. I usually do it late when it's cooled down and like sleep versus spending time in here when I could be working because I just got to work. That works my lifestyle, but my point with this is, is I would rather do two days of 40 minutes of cardio than cut my calories lower. So that's what we're going to do. Mm. Now, if I was like, I'm fucking too busy or I'd hate cardio, I don't want to do it, then we just cut my calories lower. So it's, cardio is not needed, but it can be a tool that's necessary when you don't want to cut calories. So if somebody's doing a bikini or, or a figure show or a physique show, they're almost never going to get by without doing some cardio during that prep. However, you could, it's just your calories would be so fucking low, you'd be miserable. So let's do cardio. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a bikini athlete right now. She's doing six days a week of cardio. Wow. So basically every day she walks for 40 minutes. It's a lot of cardio. Yep. And you know, I don't talk like that normally, but she's a different, she's an athlete. Yep. We have a goal of, that's very specific. This is what's required. I did the same thing. I had 45 minutes, seven days a week by then in my prep. Just like a, a morning routine. Go to the gym, go on the treadmill, 45 minutes. It was just part of it. I could have done without it, but I would have been eating next to nothing. I just have protein shakes all day. <laughs> That'd be miserable, yeah. you know, and I, it would be harder to maintain muscle. So it's just a tool, you know, but for the average person who just wants to lose 10, 20 pounds, you don't need it, but you might want to do it because it keeps you healthy because cardio is important for cardiovascular health, immune health, stuff like that, um, as well as maybe burning more calories day to day so you don't have to cut so many calories. Um, strength training, the whole purpose of strength training is it's there to ensure that you maintain strength and muscle while you go through a fat loss phase. So it's less uh, about like you don't need tons of it, right? But you got to do it and it's not going to promote more fat loss necessarily. It's really just going to promote muscle maintenance and strength maintenance uh, and joint health while you lose fat. And when you do those things, fat loss is more sustainable long term. Yeah. Plain and simple. Um, how much? I think four days is ideal for almost everybody. Five to six days is, is good for the person who's like really wants to build a lot of muscle or is like really into the gym or is an advanced lifter. They can handle more volume. But like 
you know, three days is, is I think to me is like three days is the minimum. I think people really need to see a change. Like, can you get away with one or two days a week? Of course, some is better than none. But if you really want to see changes at a pace that is allowing you to see changes every week or two where you're like, okay, I'm like starting to notice the benefits of strength training. You got to train three days a week. Yeah. If you're training once a week, you're going to have to do that consistently for a couple months before you start seeing benefits. And that's so slow that you're just going to get frustrated. Totally. Like, Fuck this. Why am I doing this? Um, I think everybody should train four days a week. Four days is like you can create a good hard stimulus, but it's also not so crazy that you can't manage it with your schedule. Most people can manage that. Totally. So. All right. Last question is actually a part two question from Rachel Wheeler. It says, should we get in, should we get to maintenance calories before doing a cut? Usually, yes. Yeah. I mean, um, well, here's the thing. is like you're probably already there. Yeah. So most likely you're already there. You don't have to get to maintenance calories. Um, so here's what I would say. If you need to get to maintenance calories because you want to cut, it tells me that you're already in a deficit, which means that you shouldn't even cut. Or just cut more. <laughs> like you just cut more calories. Um now, the only way I would say, yes, you do need to get to that is like, hey, I'm not really tracking right now. Should I figure out where my maintenance is before I dive into cut? Yeah, 100%. Um, because a lot of times when you dial things in, you start tracking, you get to maintenance, you're going to bur- actually start burning fat before you get into a cut because you've just regulated everything. Now you have your calories regulated. You've got your meals dialed in. You're starting to um, keep things more controlled. You're prepping your meals. You're planning it, so on and so forth. Now it's it's easier for you to jump into a calorie deficit. Totally. You know, so um, most of the time, yes, because you literally need to know your maintenance if you're going to create a deficit. You can't create a deficit if you don't know where you're creating a deficit from. But if you're already in a deficit, you either need to push further into deficit or you should get out and you should just stay at maintenance because you don't need to die any longer. Yeah. So. Touche. All right, cool. That, that was the last one for yep. today. Um, we'll wrap up. We still have a ton from Instagram that we're just trying to get through so we'll wrap up the the rest next week um pretty proud of myself two podcasts in a row that we record today and i got the buttons yep both times <laughs> um i'm gonna get the hang of this is gonna become more i'm gonna it's add, awesome i want to add a couple new sounds let me know yeah maybe like homer simpson going <laughs> do you know what i'm talking about when <laughs> yeah. he does that that would be perfect. That is so funny. I'm going to think of some cool. If you guys got some uh, sound suggestions, send me a private DM so yeah. I can throw them in there. That would be really cool. Oh, that's awesome. Um, but yeah. Otherwise, guys, go leave us a five-star rating review. We appreciate you. Catch you next time.